had to uh, talk to Nick Winkleman. Uh, are we allowed to ask a question? Um, yes, do that in the chat, though, please. Um, I was talking to Nick Winkleman. Uh, I don't know if you know who that is. He's writing a book out right now talking about the language of coaching. I believe his last name is Winkleman. And anyway, talking about internal cues, external cues, analogies, like when do you actually use those and things like that. And so I'm starting to like make like different lists and things like that of, you know, when, like for what swing mechanic or swing flaw do I go to this cue or this analogy or try that or, and so that way it's more of like a, a system build versus just kind of throwing stuff on the wall and hoping something sticks. Um, because I think I, one of the things that I really like to do is talk to a lot of coaches who have been around for a really long time and scouts too. Like we have scouts who have been here, been on board 30 years, 40 years. Like I want to talk to those guys for hours because they pick up like the littlest details that you, you cannot get unless you've been around for that long of a period of time. And so, like, it, it's important to, for me anyway, to um, make sure that, you know, those cues and analogies are awesome, but I want to also make sure that, like, hey, I don't want to overthink things at the same time either, right? I think sometimes, um, you know, the technology and stuff uh, allows us to do that. And I always go back to that Bill, I don't know if you watched that Bill Belichick documentary with, he was with Nick Saban, and he was talking about how he got on the plane after a loss and all of his assistants are going over video and like all these things of like what happened. And Belichick says, just like, like put all that crap away. Like we lost because we couldn't tackle. Like, That's it. And so like, sometimes I'm like, I'm like today, I'm like looking at all this, all our data analytics and graphs and everything and going at, going over everything. And I'm like, am I good digging too deep? Like, is the answer like just in, is it right in front of me? And I'm just overthinking everything too. So it, it's, it's having that self-awareness too. And that's what makes it really tough. And, and I understand why a lot of those old school guys in a sense don't like weren't all, I open the data right away. Now I think they should be for other reasons, but like I, we need people in the game with experience for sure. And spring training this year, our, our manager, Alan Mills played over 10 years in the big leagues, uh, was a pitcher. And um, he, he went up to, he came up to me after one of the scrimmage. He's like, did you see that? I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, he was like, that pitcher was tipping his pitches. I, I caught, I got everyone right. And he was and it made me realize like as a hitting coach, like I need to be like, why am I not being the one picking up on that? And so like, I started sitting next to him um, in inner squad games and things like that. We would go over and talk about, you know, tipping pitches, you know, what to look for when the pitcher's on this side of the rubber versus that side of the rubber. I mean, just like the stuff that you wouldn't think about regularly, um, just blows my mind when you get around these guys who have been around the game for a long time. And again, he's someone who from a technology standpoint or anything like that, like he doesn't, I mean, I don't think he's really into necessarily that he's open to it, but like, I want that. I want to coach with that guy just to learn all everything that he's experienced. That's yeah. That I think that's extremely important is, and I think that's where, and correct me if I'm wrong, cause you're on the inside of it more than I am right now, especially. Um, but the organizations that are able to blend that, to blend the, you know, have the old school guy and blend it in with some of the new, new school. And I'm not even a fan of using those words because really, I mean, we use a little bit of technology, but we use, I've really tried to streamline it. So we're using the technology to, it be an objective measure of our subjectiveness, if that makes sense. Like, you, you know, you can still like Belichick, we just didn't tackle, like there's the eye test right there, you know, in teaching, they want us to rubric everything. And I'm like, you know, I can watch a kid dribble a basketball and tell you if he can do it or not. Yeah. You know, I don't need to have a five point rubric on a third grader dribbling a basketball. Now, it's good to have that, to have some objectiveness there as a teacher, because now I can go, these are the things I'm looking for. And I need that reminder from time to time. And it's the same thing. Like, you know, all right, this kid swinging the bat well, but you know, there's something off. What is it? And we, you know, if you've seen thousands of swings and you have video and you can look at it, but now we have things like 4D motion or KVS and we have bad sensors. And now we can use that information to put an objective number on what we're seeing as coaches. And I think, you know, organizations, I'm just going to use the Indians because they have a guy like Terry Francona who has been around the game for a long, long time. But then they also have guy, you know, and, and their pitching coach as well. But 
they also have guys in the minor leagues that are obviously using these things and they're very analytics driven with some of the stuff and the things they do with their pitchers, especially. So I think that combination is, is probably where you're seeing the organizations that are, 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 are thriving right now. Would you agree? Totally. Yeah, definitely. agree. I mean, just as simple stuff, like, like getting players to understand, you know, what, what, what should they be doing on deck? Like, why, why are we on deck just like, with the bat weight on, like looking around to see how many people are in the stands and like, why aren't we locking in? Why aren't we trying to get our timing down? Why aren't we trying to pick up stuff on pitchers? That's the little stuff that really separates players um, long-term and, and even short-term really too. So, and the thing is, is like players don't know, like if they don't, if, if nobody really tells them anything or coaches them or, or anything like that or bring or brings it up on a regular basis, like, you, you can't like fault them. Like we just, we have to be there reminding them. I think the main thing is honestly is, and this happened to me one time, I'll never forget. Like I, I was telling uh, this one coach, I was like, man, I told this kid nine times to like do X, Y, Z. And he, and he looked at me and he's like, well, you should have told him 10. And so I was like, well, I mean, that's, it's a good point. Yeah. And so like I, more than anything now, I'm just like, it's just routine. You start and we start ingraining that into them. Like it beca- that's how like, culture and I know like everyone throws around that word nowadays but that's how it kind of starts to become a really big thing is like like what do we feel is important like let's make sure like we're harping on that every day and so little stuff like and I think that's I know I'm kind of going on a rant I ran here but I think that's where you know I was talking to a player earlier today that's where like weight discipline really comes in handy and where like you can really make big steps and big gains um, from a swing decision standpoint if you walk up to the plate and don't have a plan and are just solely reacting, and I totally understand and get that for some players that works. I, I know there's big leaguers who do it. I get that. However, for the, for the rest of us and for a lot of really good players too, if you don't have a plan and you're just reacting to everything that you're seeing, like that plate and that zone can get really big really quick. And you're not going to really have, um, you're not, it's going to be tough to lay off certain pitches because you're not always going to know of like, like where exactly everything is versus what I have to say, be, be great at what you're good at and knowing what you do really well and honing in on that or honing in on like what that pitcher is doing that, that day, that's going to allow you to shrink the zone and it's going to allow you to just simplify everything. And you're going to, and because of that, you're going to, you know, be more aggressive in that one spot. And yeah, you may take some strikes here or there, but because of that, like you're actually going to walk more and you're going to have better plate discipline versus just going up there and just, you know, not having a plan, just swinging to swing. Um, so kind of getting guys to understand that and getting them to buy in. And sometimes, you know, at, at first they may need to struggle and fail. And that's okay too. I mean, that's okay too. I mean, and then they come to you and then they're like, okay, like what I'm doing isn't working. Like we're facing guys throwing 97, 98 uh, with this much movement. And I mean, I, kid, I remember in spring training, like there was literally a guy in the mound throwing 99 with this much movement. And I was like behind the cage, and I'm like, like, what do I even tell a hitter right now? Like, to like, like good luck. I mean, hopefully you train pretty hard in the off season. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that those are some really good points. I I really like the part where you talked about, you know, knowing what you do really well and knowing what the pitcher does, because those are things even high school kids can do, even yeah. middle school. Like, as as soon as you're in. You know, I think about like, I'll even relate it to my daughter. She's, she just turned 12, but we've played some 12 year old girls that know what they're doing pitching. And if you pay attention to what they're doing, like, I know that this girl is going to throw me high that, and if you know, you're not good at hitting the high ball, then until you have two strikes, you're looking for something below your belly button and you can make your life a whole heck of a lot easier, even at the youth level, just by knowing what the pitcher's doing. And as a coach, that's our job too, especially at the youth level. It's easy to see, it's easier to pick up, I think, when they're young, as opposed to like when you're facing Garrett Cole and he's throwing so hard and has so much backspin, you can hear the ball whiz from the dugout. Like that's probably a little bit more difficult from the dugout, but there you have analytics. But if you know what you do well, and, and that's another thing where technology comes into play, I think, is I know I talked to Jason Ochart, who's the Phillies hitting coordinator and he talked about how when they were doing swing design, they really looked at the connection score on blast and like guys that were getting connected super early and had really good rotational 
um, rotational scores. He's like, those guys can really drive the ball the other way because they're getting connected early and they're able to drive the ball when it's deep in the zone. And guys that get connected later, they're going to have to drive the ball out in front of the plate more. So they're going to have to, they're going to have to have a different swing solution. They're going to have to have better vision because they're going to have to start their swing a little earlier to hit it out in front. And I mean, that's where I think the ability to pair technology with, you know, the old school thought process and the old school teaching is probably really, really important. And I know you, you use blast in your training. Um, I mean, do you want, is there anything you can elaborate on that? Yeah. I mean, I've used blast. I hate to come off as like, uh, um, like having like a know it all, but like I I've used blast for so long that I can pretty much just look on video and tell almost what each score is going to be. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um now again it has to be like the, the video can't be like i need like slow mo but i mean yeah I, if i have that i can pretty much uh tell um but i mean in terms of i mean blast i mean i've i've seen some crazy stuff on there that's worked so it's really hard for me to like put certain players in different buckets and things like that um and and the other thing is like with the technology when you get to the professional level is it's it's really difficult to make changes on the fly when you're playing games every day and when players are worried about having a job, right? Yeah. Because if they don't play well, like they're getting released. It's not like high school baseball or something where like you're just, you're going to sit the bench for a couple games. Like you're, you're going home. So um, in terms of the, specifically the rotation and things like that, I haven't, I haven't seen anything like that, um, but I'll be honest in spring training, like you really don't have a ton of time to really dive into that. Now, now I do, but I mean, you're, you're there at 6 a.m. and you're leaving at five or six mm -hmm. and you're, just, you're out in the field working with guys the entire time. So if you don't really have a ton of time to like look at all the, the data and everything that's coming in. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't seen that at all um, in terms of blast. Do you, um, Patrick asked a question. Patrick's a guy that worked for us a little bit this last year, and he's at OU now. Um, and I mean, I think he took over. Uh, Travis Fitta left there. He was at OU, and Travis Fitta is now with the Cubs. Um, I think Patrick took over some of the duties that uh, Travis did with OU. Um, Patrick's question was Do you teach or practice more linear or rotational usage? Each player is designed a little differently, so it varies. But where have you seen more success from these two perspectives? Uh, well, it was funny. I was listening to a Zoom call the other day of um, a couple of hitting coaches, big league hitting coaches that, um, that I've gotten to know. Donnie um, Eckers, one. He was talking about how he's never heard of anyone in professional baseball been like, you know, I wish that guy would rotate more. You know, I wish he had a little bit more rotation. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe with that. So I would say like definitely more linear um, in the sense that, I mean, obviously you have to have both, but I just don't think you need to tell a player to rotate. Like they're going to rotate. I think harping on direction and like keeping the barrel in the zone a little bit longer. Um, and that's where we can kind of, you know, talk about, you know, mix in like the rap soda spin stuff and you can really see like, is their barrel in the zone long for a long period of time or not. Um, so I would say definitely linear just because, uh, if you can't take like that inside pitch and like, we'll see this lot that inside pitch. Like I want you to be able to hit that like dead center. If you can hit that dead center and you're constantly hooking it around it, like that's eventually going to be an issue. And, and pitchers are eventually going to eat you alive because the, of the, how extensive the scouting reports are these days. So definitely linear, just because again, every player is going to rotate. So big thing is direction. I'm very big on bat path and very big on direction um, and hitting through the ball. Uh, that's like probably my, my biggest thing. So with linear though, you're referring to more of direction. Like you're talking about being able to maintain and hold posture, um, uh, switch your forward lean with your side bend. You're not talking like old school, Charlie Lau linear, like get on the front foot, lead arm extension, or are you, are you into that? Oh, okay. I must have missed. I miss misunderstood the question. I wouldn't. And I wouldn't say no. I'm not like get on the front foot. Um, but it's funny because you do watch. Like I was watching like Roberto Clemente a video, and I was like, he would get destroyed on hitting Twitter if that video was today, and he was like a prospect. I mean, and it's like that. That's like a freaking like all star stud. So um, Hank Aaron too. I mean, some of the swings Hank Aaron took would get yeah, destroyed. Yeah, so, 
So I'd say it's a combination of both. Um, I just want guys to be in, in balance. I don't want – I don't really like big moves um, per se. I just – guys throw so freaking hard, man, and the stuff is so nasty. You just – you can't afford – um, to have a big move. I think a big thing is upper body. I think the upper body is honestly more important um, for me personally than the lower half, because if the upper half, if my shoulders remain parallel, even if I do, do get fooled with my lower half, I still have a chance. I still have a chance to do damage versus uh, vice versa. If I'm already like, um, if my lower, if my upper half's already like you know, back shoulders dropping too early. I'm diving too far in with my front shoulder. Then the swing's just going to be affected by that. And you're going to be screwed. So I definitely do think um, it's a little bit of both. Um, but I, I see guys who lose their backside, but their upper half is still in an optimal position. And so they still get good swings off and barrel off balls. Um, I know that's probably not really the answer he's looking for, but the thing about hitting is usually the answer is it depends. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. And I mean, the one thing that doesn't depend is balance. Like you said, balance. And I mean, you'll see guys lose their lower halves and the, the guys at the elite level, they have so much control and stabilization. They're able to control that upper body, like you said, and they have upper body control so they can lose their lower body a little bit and they stay back and they're still able to generate force because as you said, the, every major leaguer rotates. Those guys are elite level rotators. Um, and then I'm going to segue in. I got a couple of questions I'm going to try to get to, but I'm going to segue into something that I was really excited to talk to you about. And that is the differences between teaching youth players hitting and teaching, you know, elite level hitters like minor leaguers, major leaguers. There, there's, a, there's a huge difference. You know, we always, especially on hitting Twitter and when guys like you and I talk and when I talk to Ryan and Rachel, like, we love to talk about the elite athletes, but I mean, what percentage of baseball and softball players are elite? You know, there's a lot more that are not elite. We're talking about the 1% of the 1% that are, you know, playing major league baseball. If that, I mean, it might even be smaller than that, but what, what's the difference in working with those two populations? Uh, I noticed this like the first week, like professional hitters can, I can ask them to do something or try something out. And they can pull it off and really like try it and it shows up almost immediately. And it was like, like that. And I remember that happening and be like, damn, like I'm a good coach, you know, <laughs> versus like, like you have like a, a younger kid in there, like that's not going to happen because a lot of times they just don't have the functional strength or I mean, whatever it may be. Um, so I think that's, that's one. I mean, they do have, they, when you ask a young hitter, like, Hey, like, what'd you feel in that swing? They're like, I don't know. I have no idea. You know what I mean? Versus if I ask a professional here, more than likely, like they're going to have some, they're going to have something for me. And I think that helps so much because like hitting is uh, a conversation. Like I can't, I, I get, if I don't know how, what you are thinking or feeling, it's very hard for me to kind of like really recommend anything for you or like really like kind of like guide you down the right path and so I the, the older players you can have those conversations a lot of times because they understand what they feel and honestly that's a huge difference and besides from the obvious bat you know bat speed power and everything mm -hmm. like that it's just they they're not for the most part they're not up there like swinging and have no idea what they felt or saw now sometimes some players do like I'll, they'll come back to the dugout like, what was that pitch? You know, but I have no idea. It was like, it was a curveball. You know what I mean? And he, no, he thought he could have said fastball. But I mean, for the most part, they have some feel. I would say that's the biggest thing that I, that I would see is they can make adjustments a lot quicker and then they actually show up and they understand their body way better. Like the feel, what, what in-game scenarios approach, things like that. Those, those are the two big ones. So how do you, when you first start working with a, a young kid, um, you know, eight, nine, 10, even 11, 12, what, what are some things you're looking for with their movements in general with the swing? That's, it's tough because like, especially at that age, like kids develop at different stages. So you might have a kid who's pretty big and strong at that age or someone who's like, a, you know, like a, going to be like a late bloomer. He just, he just drop barrel drags every time. And if that happens, sometimes like we'll have him do like, uh, I'm sure you've seen this before, like split grip. 
mm-hmm. just to allow them because again like they're they're dropping that barrel at each time to allow them to do a split grip so it kind of allows their bat to not drop so much um, but I want to build the engine first I mean I want them to swing with intent I think we can we can fix the little stuff later like I was just saying before like the, the guys the older players in their 20s and stuff they can make those mechanical adjustments like I would say like being able to build that engine, having that intent, that sort of a thing, that's what I really want to hone in more than anything else. And I want them to be curious. Like I want them to, in a sense, I really like fall in love with the game and the process and everything like that. Because in a sense, it doesn't even matter how good of a coach I am if they're not playing in five or six years. So I want them to have that curiosity. I want them to ask questions. Um, fall in love with the game, fall in love with, you know, just the, the work and be able to also see some results, see themselves get, get better too. And then like, Hey, like when they do get better, like remind them, like, Hey, like you couldn't do this before. Like, good job. You know what I mean? So that, I mean, from a, I would say that age range, you just, you see so many different things. Um, but for the, I, I really don't want to cue those kids up. I don't, I don't want to, you know, mechanically, they have no idea what's going on. They don't know what their pelvis even is. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we're, I, we got to make sure it's very, very simple. There's, there's so many, those kids have so many degrees of freedom and they just don't understand. They, have, they don't have any, you know, their movement experience is so small that they don't have a feel for anything. Um, and I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox here because I know you're an on-base you guy. And, I mean, Dr. Greg Rose talks about that, you know, build the engine, like move fast, move as fast as you can. And then when those players, they discover what feels good, they discover what movement is, what movement feels good, what movement feels bad eventually. And once they have more experience with that, then – you know, then you can like hone in on those fine things you talked about. And as a coach, you know, I said the word dynamic systems theory and you talked about the environment earlier. A lot of times as coaches, under cueing a kid is way better than over cueing a kid. And that's why kids, one of the reasons I truly feel kids love video games because parents and coaches and teachers aren't standing over them telling them what to do. And if, I mean, I don't, my kids don't play video games, but if yours do, uh, just try it. Just stand over them for 30 straight minutes and tell them everything they're doing wrong, just like you do at the ball field and see how long they're going to want to play that video game. Or let them come to your workplace and tell them everything you're doing wrong for 30 minutes and see how you feel about that. So, I, I mean, the things you've said are just like, oh, they make me feel great because that, that, that's really good. I mean, I... I'm going to say this and I'm going to let you respond whether you agree or not. I don't think you can go wrong at the youth level telling a kid to hit swing, swing as hard as they can and try to hit a line drive. No, 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 you can't. You can't. And to your point, like no coaching is better than bad coaching. And like, I often actually like think about that because I think sometimes like I remember even like, even in spring training, you're like, I, I would often feel like, like, should I say something? Like, should I, like, I, I just feel like, I just felt at certain times that I was like, just trying to get to know the guys. So I didn't want to like say anything. I didn't really know their swings too much, but like, am I overthinking this? Like, should I say something? And then I was like, you know what? Like, no, like they're fine. Like, let me sit back, observe what they're doing. And we'll talk about it later on. Like they don't. And I think that's the, the problem is, is when you're coaching, like you should, you feel the need to say something just because you're coaching. And I, I think oftentimes it's, it's best to say less. I, I really, I, wholeheartedly believe that especially during the game like guys on deck I, I, he does not need to be hearing from me at that moment you know what I mean like go up there like watch this like change up on that 2-1 pitch or you know what I mean as the ball's moving away from him, you know keep your you know keep your hands up like that that does, it doesn't really help it just it doesn't so yeah I I'm a big fan of what you're saying no nothing you say to a player between the white line is nothing you say to a player on game day is going to make them better between the white lines, unless you can somehow get inside of their head psychologically and make them feel like they're Superman. Like that's the only thing, like anything else you do is just going to dome them up in my opinion. Um, shoot. I lost my train of thought. You said something that I really wanted to go with and now I, I lost it. Um, somebody asked a question here excluding technology what are what are your two favorite training aids for hitting and why uh excluding technology um you know what i actually uh started messing around in spring training like those like um 
dog, that dog toy. Yeah, the Line Drive Pro. No, 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 not the Line Drive Pro. Um, it's a, it's like literally like a dog toy um, that you buy. It's similar to the Line Drive Pro, but it's like, um, it's literally like a, it's like it's a dog toy. For, I can't believe I can't remember the name, but you just put a tennis ball at the very end of it. Um, similar to Line Drive Pro, but it's like literally like a piece of plastic. It's, I went to, I literally went to Walmart with one of the other coaches in Sarasota and we like, we bought a bunch of them and we bought a bunch of hula hoops too. And oh like, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, and it's like, it, it's just, it blew my mind. We were laughing and then we bought ropes as well. Like we, you know, we spend all this money on technology and, and what do we do to try to, to fix it? Like we go buy hula hoops, a couple dog toys and some ropes. And it, <laughs> it, it was like, it was unbelievable. So I would say those dog toys, I'll, I'll send you the link or I'll tweet it out after. Okay. For, um, but I've seen it before and it just really helps with, it's just instant feedback on direction. And it's like, it's one of those things where like I used to, I would get in the cage and try to feel it out. And it really, you just have to feel it's feel you swing two hands, one hand as well. And like you, you'll, you'll get in there and you'll start hooking the ball right away. You'll start hooking it right, right away. Like the ball go off to the side. So that's a big one. The hula hoops. Uh, we did that. Um, just to kind of explain again some swing direction stuff and like body posture and tilt and kind of what happens like to your swing like when your posture when you come up too early um, but I would say so I would say those two things and then honestly I remember even like Monty Lee talked about it when I recorded a podcast with him is like in a cage like you take a bat or a fungo and you throw it up and you hit it and I know that sounds crazy but like trying to stay dead center like you're going to know right away what, how good your direction is like and that's like an old school drill but I love it and implement it like with with some of the guys too and even like and I'll be honest like sometimes when we get these drills out like some of the guys because they had never seen a lot of this stuff before they're like like what like what are we doing and it it helps because some of the guys are actually active on Twitter and social media so they've gone to some of these hitting guys before who do all this new stuff and then they actually are the ones that like help kind of like like guys like we've done this before like I'll show you this is this actually helps a lot so I would say the dog toy ropes for visualization just for like different like goals like where we want us to hit um, so you're hanging them from the net yeah yeah we'll, we'll do that um that I've actually that was actually the first time I've ever done anything like that of like hanging the ropes and stuff for well, yeah because you had hit tracks that. Right, exactly. I was spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, but I, I do like that giving them some sort of goal. Because even on like, if you have like a Rapsodo out there, they'd be like, what's well, 25 degrees? Like, what does that look like? What should we aim for? And so you can actually put like hula hoops up too. I've seen that like you hang the hula hoops up and like you're aiming for to hit it. The there hoops. But I think like, again, that goes back to like external, like, you know, external cues. Like, I think that's big because so many guys get in their own head like the, the mental side is is um is something that like everyone has to fight um that's awesome yeah you touch back right on to that setting up the environment with with easy things you know um hula hoops i i love the idea we don't use them and i i don't know why but i love the idea of using the hula hoops for visualization on how you know to posture the swing and and keep everything in line the right way for direction um there's another question here if you since you coached high school ball if you were setting up a hitting practice for a high school team with 12 to 15 players and you know you know high school staffs are small how how did you guys go about that at molar well we were lucky at molar because we had i mean the facilities were really nice um but uh I, before i was at molar i coached at madeira it was just one cage in a gym and so like that was where like you get that's where you really start like getting creative with stuff so i would i like you using um, um a lot of pvc stuff a lot of movement stuff getting them to um, understand what the movement is we want um and then i would set up different constraints too like i really like the um constraint kyle i don't, I don't know if you i'm sure you've seen this one too where you have the t um out in front of your front foot and you just put it up I know, Brian, we've done this before, too. Like we put the tee up, like, probably, like, a belt high. And you take a – you have to take a swing. And you, if you take a swing and you rotate too early, so your barrel's east to west too much, like, you're going to hit the tee versus, like, staying it, like, in line. Like, continually, like, 
having good direction and things like that. So that's another constraint we would do. If you have a machine, I like the machine. I don't like necessarily fastballs on the machine because uh, the fastballs just rise and spin rate just gets insane. So I would, I'm a big slider guy. I love sliders. So if you could somehow get a slider as well. Um, and I actually do like doing some short bat, um, but two hand swings, short bat, two hand swings. Reason being is, um, a big part of high school is uh, connection. I feel like sometimes it's bad um, just because their posture is kind of, they're kind of coming in and out too much. So using like a really smaller bat, and, but taking like a regular swing with two hands, like it forces them to really understand and realize like they have to stay in posture or they're going to come out too early and their bat's going to hit the end. Can you explain connection for some of the people listening? I don't know if everybody knows what connection is. So I would say like, like connection is like, I, when I say connection, I usually like think of it in terms of the blast motion metric of like early connection. Like, you know, we kind of want our barrel to be like around 90 degrees, right? Right before we actually start our swing in the zone. And in so relationship to 90 our, degrees in our spine. Yeah. Like spine angle, which, um, yeah, that's like, it, it, it can get pretty in depth, but for the most part, <laughs> like, we want our we want our we want our uh, barrel to be about ninety degrees. We don't want it to be like too vertical. Like when we by the time our front foot lands and we start our swing, we don't want it to be too flat either. Kind of like right in the middle, right in between, and then right at contact as well. We don't want our upper body coming up too early as we're swinging at contact, um, and we don't want to be like too far over too. So we just like it just kind of the relationship of our spine and barrel um at initiation of the swing and then at contact as well awesome that's good stuff there <laughs> um do you have any <laughs> excuse me suggestions for high school players trying to build an approach to the plate or any mental tools they can use to get ready for the game or an at bat yeah i got a, i got a couple mental tools i our big league hitting coach um Don Wong has really got me into this guy, Trevor Moed, who's a you know, mental conditioning coach for Russell Wilson and a, a bunch of pro guys. And, you know, his big thing is, is say less negative stuff and it's not be more positive. And it's so it's, he goes into it. Like, it's literally like a science, like what you say out loud is 10 times more impactful than anything you think. And if you say something negative about your stuff, out loud or about yourself out loud it's three to four times more impactful on top of that so that's literally 300 to 400 more times more impactful if you say something negative about yourself out loud so in spring training for for certain guys i'd be like if i i would explain that to them explain them explain the process and everything like you start saying negative stuff about yourself you start throwing your bat and that stuff. Like I'm not going to get pissed off because I'm not, I'm just not a, like, that's not my personality. I'm not a yell or anything like that. I'm just going to pick up the balls and we're just, we'll get back after it tomorrow. And I think more than anything, it really makes them realize like, like this stuff is like, does matter. Like what you say out loud, like the negative things like that. So what I have to tell guys is be less negative because where do we want to be? We want to be neutral. Okay. And if I'm, sucking at the plate and someone says you know keep your head up like that's kind of honestly like not exactly what I really want to hear a lot of times what players want to hear for that at that moment and so if I tell a player be less negative it's easier to get to that neutral state than it is be more positive so that's one of the things that I would say that you can implement literally right now is like don't say negative stuff out loud about yourself ever you know what I mean? Like, and when you do start to like, and I tell guys, you can't always control your mind is crazy. I mean, it'll go different ways. It'll, you know, I'm, I don't need to get into that. I'm sure everyone knows has crazy thoughts at times. So you can't always control that, but you can control what you say out loud and the science backs it up. It, there's so many stories of players who it bill, bill Buckner, the guy who had the ball went underneath mm -hmm. his leg. 86 uh, world series. Yeah, they, they did this, this guy, Trevor, Mo, Trevor Mohead, uh, found an interview of, that, of him and said like, uh, like a week before that game, he goes, you know, it, it would be a real shame if, if I ended up making like um, an error that lost us the game. And, and so like just by him like bringing that to light, like he's, he's now like that's now out there. And I didn't like solely make it happen, but 
by him saying that, like now it, it becomes like out in the air a little bit more, if you will. So there's tons of stories about that. As far as uh, finding an approach, I think that that can be, it goes back to um, what you do well in a sense. So, and Kyle, you brought up a good point. Even high school players know what they do well. And um, if you don't, like, I'm sure your parents know what you do well and don't do well because they watch everything. Um, so I think that can, you build your approach off of what you do well and don't do well. And don't necessarily worry a ton about what you don't do well. Um, you know, we have really freaking good hitters who will make millions and millions of dollars. And there are certain parts of the zone they stink at. And I, we, I don't really tell them, hey, like, let's, let's try to patch that up a little bit more. You know what I mean? It's like, no, like, let's just focus on what you're really, really good at and dominate that. Like, don't worry, just take those pitches. You know, don't worry. Even if you strike out looking at that pitch low and a win, like, don't, I'm not going to say anything. Who cares? Don't worry about it. Pitchers aren't, you know, we give them too much credit, even at the professional level. Like, they can't, they can't pepper in balls on the exact low and outside corner every single time, every at bat. So they'll make a mistake. Um, but just have something. And I think the approach over time um, is something that can change too. But I think by you bringing up the approach, like to your player, to your son, whoever it may be, like that's going to get the ball rolling. And I think um, that's where journaling comes into play too. Like what did you, that's where I think like feel, like getting kids to understand feel and things like that. That's where the, I think the journal is because you go back and, and you write down your at-bat, you write down, um, you know, what you felt during that at-bat, what the pitcher, how you pay out the ball, things like that. Like, and over time, you'll get better at it. Um, you may not write, be able to write down a whole bunch at first, but this is a process. It takes years and years and years to get good at it. So starting to implement some of that stuff now is going to allow him to have a really freaking good approach, you know, maybe, maybe even in like in a year or two. That's really, I, I love that. I, that's a great quote. Say less negative things. And I put in the chat, I put some books down there that <clears throat> I've read in the past that are really good. One of them that everybody can read really fast. It's even written for kids in middle school and high school. It's great. Even younger. It's, um, it's called The Young Champion's Mind by Dr. Jim Aframal. That's really good. 90% uh, Mental by Bob Tewksbury. I haven't read that one, but the reviews are awesome. Heads Up the Baseball by Ken Revisa is amazing. Um, H.A. Dorfman wrote one years ago called uh, The Mental Game of Baseball. And I remember one of the, one of the illustrations is there in there was Don't Think About a Pink Elephant. And what do you do? You think about a pink elephant. So if you're saying don't strike out, your mind doesn't work in negatives. It only works in positives. So if you say don't strike out, you're really thinking about striking out. And I, from a personal standpoint, my biggest issue, I, I would roll over the ball a lot. I would hit a lot of ground balls at short stop and third base. And they would usually be hard, and which means I didn't have a chance to leg them out. And when I was going bad, my thought process was always don't hit a ground ball to short stop. And every time. And, and I mean, I knew these things. I just, I didn't do what I needed to mentally to prepare myself the right way. I didn't spend enough time on that. You know, I was more of the guy that I'm going to swing till my hands bleed every single day to get out of it. When if I would probably would have backed off and spent 20% of my time swinging and 80% of my time on the headspace of the game, I probably would have been oodles better, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's just, that is very, very important. I'm, I'm really glad that somebody asked that question and you addressed that. Yeah, um, we, actually, we actually started doing some meditation, actually, um, a little bit even in spring training, um, which, I, I, again, to each their own. It's, for some guys, it's going to work and it's going to help. I would actually say another thing that I've been thinking about lately about helping your mental game at the plate is actually, like, falling in love with defense, and I say that because, like, if you fall in love with defense and you want to get really good at defense and you work really hard at defense and stuff like that, it's going to allow you to, to take. It's going to allow you to take some pressure off at the plate. And I, I've noticed that with a few different players now um, who I've been able to work with, like you know, really starting to hone in, telling them like, "Hey, you're a really freaking good defender out there. Like, you're really, really good." And and not just BS them, like, you know, they are good because they have to put in the work. And that just seems to take off, take some more pressure off the bat because everyone knows if you don't hit, you will not get to the big leagues. Like, that's a thing. 
And so, like, since you know that, you kind of got to trick some guys sometimes into, into understanding that, hey, like, that, it, that may be true, but you guys still got to play defense. And if you focus more so on that and just let hitting be a reactionary thing, like, you're probably going to end up hitting better, too. It's awesome. Um, you, you and I have uh, something in common, and that's that we both coach at the high school level and work as private instructors. Um, and I, well, you know, when I coached, I had kids that went to our baseball school, and we had kids that went to other places. And I didn't, I didn't mess with them. Like that was their thing. Like they, they all bought in. We had really coachable kids. I was really blessed coming up. How do you? I know some coaches frown upon that. How do you? how do you bridge the gap between the coach and the private instructor? You know, I actually, uh, I like it. I like that they go see other people um, because it's a different perspective for them. And I think um, it's even with, with our guys in professional baseball, um, not going to mention this particular guy's name, but you know, not the biggest fan of, and you know what, like, I actually, I'm not going to like, rip an outside instructor for anything any reason like I because and this is I heard this the other day and it's so freaking true kind of goes back to like people being attracted to certain people like we could say the same thing Kyle like we're talking about the same thing let's just say swing direction but we say it two different ways mm -hmm. and, and John over mm -hmm. here he doesn't connect with me he's connecting with you the way you say it makes more sense go go see Kyle you know what I mean and so like we're saying the same thing it's not mm -hmm. you're not any smarter than me I'm not any smarter than you we're just saying it different ways and so I think sometimes that's where I, I do kind of like it because if if that outside instructor can say it in a different way and it clicks for him awesome and that's why I try to pick so many coaches brains because I it's not I understand the body how it moves the swing all that but I I don't know every single way to say it so it clicks for each hitter and it could be a, a little league coach may have some stupid little phrase and I might steal it and it may, may help me like work with a player um, at, even at the professional level. So I think the language part of it is why I'm okay with them going to an outside instructor. Now, if they're doing crazy stuff and it's not working, then I, then we got to kind of talk about it. But for the most part, the, once the, the game really will dictate whether – the player is going to be open to changes or open to if maybe it's not working or not. And if it's not working, like they know it, like they're not going to keep, you know, doing the exact same thing out there. And that's when they'll come and we'll talk about it. But I don't, I'm very big into not bashing whoever a kid goes to. I don't think that's how you get them to do what you want. I really don't. Um, I just, and I just don't believe, believe it in general. It goes back to the empathy aspect of coaching and building a rapport. And I mean, the best coaches really, I think, are they can set culture, they can build rapport and, and with their players, um, and, and they're master integrators, as you said. You hear a thing, you talk to as many coaches as you can, and I do the same thing. And we, you know, I mean, really, that's what hitting Twitter is to me. Is it's just well, I mean, it's a now it's a community of some really cool people that I met that I'm very blessed to have, but it's just a, it's a place for, it's a brain dump. I mean, that's what I use a lot of social media for is a brain dump. And I think other people do it too. And I get a lot of different things that now I can process that information and integrate it. So if I'm not getting through to Jimmy or Susie, like here's another way that I can teach them that might get through to them. Did, did Tim, did coach Held give you a lot of leeway with the hitters when you were at Moeller? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely did, um, which was great and had a lot of fun with that, um, was able to experiment a little bit. And they got a great – I mean, their staff up there is awesome, unbelievable, you know, really open-minded, um, not old school at all. I mean, old school in some regards, but, like, the good type of regard, just fundamentals and things like that, um, but totally open. I mean, look, like, he was one of the first – like, I, probably the first high school in the, in the nation to buy a freaking hit tracks. So, I mean, I obviously like they're, they're open to that type of stuff and um, want to win. So they, they want, they want what's best for their players. That's awesome. Um, we're going on the hour mark. I don't want to steal any of your time. I could sit here and talk hitting with you forever and pick your brain. Um, but before you, before you, uh, before we leave here, I, are there some resources that you can recommend for people to go, you know, for co coaches to increase their knowledge on the swing um, or their ability to teach it? Like, what are your favorite 
follows on social media or books or internet resources that they could maybe easily find or purchase? You know, I, uh, in terms of like, that's tough because it's like, I like so many people and hitting Twitter is so awesome because there's so many awesome resources. I actually, you know, I, I take bits and pieces from everyone. I, there's not one person who's like, I agree with every single thing that guy is saying. And I don't think that, it should, that should be the case, even for people mm-hmm. watching this. Like, don't say, oh, just because he's saying, like, I'm going to do everything the same way. I like a lot of some of the stuff that Doug Latta says and teaches, even though he's, like, anti-technology, like, to the heart. I think, I think some of that stuff's really good. I've watched a lot Did of the videos. I don't mean to interrupt. Did you read Swing Kings yet? I haven't, no. Oh my God. It's amazing. It's awesome. I read it in like five days. I couldn't put it down. It talks about Craig Wallenbrock and like that dude, I, I kept having to look at it and be like, is that my dad? Like he literally like after college, my dad took a motorcycle to Mexico and lived there for a few years. And like Wallenbrock did the same thing. And like just all the stuff they talk about, like balance and this and that. I'm like, this is like my, this is my dad right here. Like this dude's my, I want to meet this dude. Yeah, like, no, it's, if he did interrupt, go on. No, no, I totally like Craig Wallenbach's another guy, but he doesn't have a lot of really content out there to um, mm-hmm. consume. But I would say Doug Loud is one. Um, you know, I, I like uh, Darren uh, Everson, uh, hitting coordinator for the Rockies. Um, I'm actually going to have him on my podcast in the next couple weeks, but he's been on like the Stick and Ball TV podcast, um, which was good. But I, I, look, I, I ask him a lot of questions, um, and he's helped me out a ton. Um, but I would say like, I just search there, I just there, search all the time. Like I will, I scroll through Instagram and I'm like, Oh, I, I like that. True. Like, I like that movement. Like I'm going to steal that, you know, or I'm going to all DM that guy and ask a question about that. Um, or, you know, Twitter, same thing. Like reach out to different coaches and like, um, get, get their feedback on certain things. So I, w- I would say, and it's funny because it's like, I, I wouldn't think that, I'd imagine myself saying like the only source you should go watch is Doug Latta on YouTube, but it's kind of the safest bet in a sense um, because he, he believes so much in direction and swing path. And so do I. He's really moderate with what he talks about. Like he's not a, he's not a, he's not dogmatic with anything he, he speaks about in my opinion. Yeah. I, I think he's also less is more. So he doesn't like overloading players with information and I'm, like that too. I don't want to give guys too much information at times. Um, and, and I think the more, the thing is that I've noticed over my path as a coach since I've started is start diving and digging into certain, certain coaches, right? Like even someone who teaches like swing that one guy we always refer to, like even someone like him, what, like watch his stuff, watch his stuff. Like, maybe you might pick up something from it. And then that's going to help kind of form your further development as a coach, because you'll be able to pick up something from him. And then you'll go to like someone like Doug Latta and pick up something from him. And then you go to this next guy. And then before you know it, like you kind of have your core philosophy in a sense, and you're still open-minded, like you're still wanting to learn, but you're, but you have like your kind of your core, what you believe in. And you combine that with continually working with players and that's when you really get a mold into something that like you, you believe in. That, that one guy, I've actually picked up some things that have helped a lot of our, that have helped some of our players. So have I, mean, I. I just not going to admit yeah. it. But yeah. Yeah, I get it. Hey, <laughs> I, I lied here because there's one question I have to ask you. There's one more question I have to ask you for, I, for a lot of years, I was feel guy, like let's develop feel, let's do this drill for feel, 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 feel. And when I found hitting Twitter, my mind got opened up to some different things like the technology aspect of stuff like in it. And it really helped solidify my thought process and my beliefs. And it really helped give me a way to test it. Um, and I wanted to ask you this question. So I'm, I'm going to keep you if you're cool with that for another couple of minutes. What right. can you just talk briefly about the difference and the importance of the feel versus the real? Because, you know, we got guys like a rod that are talking about hitting down on the ball, but they don't. And we got guys like trout that say the same thing, even pool holds. There's a huge difference in that. And some of the drills you post, I, I love seeing the drills you post. And I know that you're a big guy in direction and I love the drills. It, it, it's really good for me to see because it, it, it's just, it is important. It is important to develop feel for kids. 
Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. But I would say feel – I remember feel can be misleading because I think sometimes with feel is feels change. And so feels can sometimes just be a Band-Aid. Um, for example, if I am swinging underneath the ball a ton and I give a kid, uh, you know, feel like you're taking your top hand and just hitting the top part of the ball or whatever, and then his swing flattens out, he hits a couple line drives, like, oh, awesome, like that's working. And then he starts literally like hitting the top part of the ball and hitting a couple ground balls. Well, now what do we, now we got to come up with a, a completely different feel, you know what I mean? So you're, and you're always going to be doing that. Um, so I, that's where I think understanding, like having some sort of understanding of what you're actually doing is important because that way you're going to have something to go back to when things do go wrong. And, you know, we have like this phone, like that's all you really need in a sense from a technology standpoint. And um, sometimes what you feel may not necessarily be good, but, and I remember JD Martinez said this, like you, what you feel may not feel good, but like if you go out there and you go four for four, like I guarantee you that's, that's feeling good. You know what I mean? I guarantee that that's going to start feeling good before you know it. And so uh, the feel versus real thing, like, you know, I guess some guys are like, I'm just trying to feel something out. Like, what are you trying to feel out? You know what I mean? And I just want to get them to start thinking about that. And I think for a lot of guys, like thinking swing down is because being able to handle that pitch, especially for bigger guys, um, the, the top part of the zone, like you have to think swing down or else, or get on top of the ball, wherever it be, or else you have no chance against 95 plus. And so I, I think that's what ends up happening a lot of times. I think we look at guys like Mike Trout and A-Rod and, and the freaks of the world. And we don't, we, we forget that I could put A-Rod and Mike Trout and have them do these stupidest drills in the entire world that make no sense that nobody does. And guess what? Mike Trout's going to go out there and he's still going to be Mike Trout. And mm -hmm. A-Rod's still going to be out there and still be A-Rod. And, and, and I think that's hard for some people to, to grasp, but the fact of the matter is, is Mike Trout doesn't actually really need anybody to help him, help coach him. And neither does A-Rod. And, and, but those guys are just like on another planet. Um, and if you're that good too, then log off right now. You don't need that. <laughs> but um, but that, I, that, again, that goes back. So for me, just to kind of clarify, like the feel, I think that is important. But feels do change. And that's where I think – understanding having some sort of understanding of what you actually do is important so you can go back to that when you do struggle because you will struggle that's awesome man i really appreciate it uh if you don't have anything else to say to anybody i mean you can say whatever you want um i will let you go because i appreciate your time and uh i appreciate everybody that's on here i did record um, everything, but maybe the first five or 10 minutes, I forgot to hit record. So, um, if Patrick's cool with it, uh, when I get that recording, I will upload it on YouTube. So you guys can go back and watch your favorite parts of this when Patrick talks and I don't. So, no, I appreciate it, Kyle. I'm glad we got to connect and get on here. And, um, you know, this is, this was a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's a unique time right now. I, I honestly feel busier now than honestly, I think I've ever felt because I have nothing but time to learn. And I, I have nothing but time to talk to people. I have access to more people right now than I probably will ever will in my life. Mm -hmm. and so I remember driving back home from spring train mm -hmm. and be like getting, and this sounds weird, but having this weird type of excitement because um, I knew I was going to have, I'd be able to talk to literally, like nobody has an excuse that, to, that, that will say, no, I won't talk to you. Like mm -hmm. nobody's doing anything. Um, I, but at the same time, I do want to say that I do, it's not, I don't want to come off as like, I'm really excited and happy everything's going on because I, you know, there's so many people out there struggling and have right. lost jobs and things like that. And I really, like that, that hurts. It sucks. Like I'm really feel bad for them and think about them and, and pray for them um, every day because, you know, they did nothing wrong at all to deserve any of this, but um, so yeah, again, appreciate everyone coming on, you know, listening. If you have any questions, you just DM me. I'm an open book. I don't know 